My heart is to see God's people full of passion and the fire of God, hungry for His presence on a daily basis, full of His power and having a positive impact on the world and those around them, living a life of freedom and victory. This is Running With Fire. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Tark Barna. Change. Well, the word almost causes ripples within our heartbeat. It's a challenge, isn't it? All of life, we face changes. From the time you're born, through school, getting married, kids, change, change, change. Some people love it, thrive on it. Others hate it. I wonder where you are on that spectrum of enjoying or loathing change. The president of about the third most wealthy company in the world said, a key to success is thriving on change. Not just accepting change or putting up with change, but actually thriving on it. In this message, I want to look at why change is absolutely important in our lives and also how you can cope with change. The better you handle change, the more you will enjoy life and become the person that you are meant to be. Stay tuned. Well, I read a very challenging statement of late by the president of the third most valuable company in the world. And this is what he said. He said, a key to continued success is thrive on change. Say that with me. Thrive on change. How many of you want continued success? Yeah. All right. All of us, we want that, so thrive on change. It didn't say just accept change. It didn't say be open to change. It didn't even say embrace change. It said thrive. Grab a hold of it. Run with it. Go with the changes that God brings into your life. The challenge is to respond to change and not be a nuclear reactor. How many of you are reactors to, yeah, some of you just change, you know, it's a, you know, <laughs> a real mess. All around. But God doesn't want that. Mark Twain said this. The only person who likes change is a wet baby. (laughs) I'm a bit more familiar with that of late. Not that I do any of the changing of the nappies. I'll have you know that. But they like to be changed when things get a bit wet. Our natural instinct is always to resist the winds of change. You resist it, I change. We all resist it. Especially when they blow over our lives. And these winds of change are going to come. You know that, I know that. Some of them will come gently and just move you. Please shift over here a little bit. Let's just adjust this little bit other time. Other times a change will be like a hurricane or a tornado and you go whack, bang, and you think, oh man, what's going on here? And you're just in turmoil. That's how life is. You'll experience both from time to time. For some, getting married is a gentle wind of change. For others, getting married, it's a hurricane tornado that just... Throws them into turmoil. It can be very different for different people. But when there is a shift in heaven, there comes a sift on earth. It means this. When God is wanting to do something new in our lives, in our homes, our families, in our businesses, in our church, we will face a sifting. We will face changes, adjustments which are not always comfortable. But God is up to something good. And everyone said, come with me to Luke chapter 5 and verse 37 to 39. It says, and no one puts new wine into an old wineskin. How many of you would like some new wine of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, you would? Then you better become a new wineskin. It can't just go into the old. It's got to be be adjusted. It's got to be changed. It's got to become new. No one puts new wine into the old wineskin or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled. And the wineskin will be ruined. You don't want to be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. New wine, new wineskins. Have you got it? New ministry, new fruitfulness, new future, new wineskin. Something's got to adjust. Something's got to be changed. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires the new, for he says the old was better. 
There's a great tendency to think that the old was better. Often that's actually just a fantasy. You know, we talk about the good old days, but the truth is the good old days were never as good as we think they were. We create this fantasy of, oh, way back there in the yonder, how beautiful it was. Friends, it wasn't that beautiful at all. God is always moving forward. He's always up to something new. And to move forward, we have got to embrace change. To move into the new, you have to let go of the old. And friends, the old was not better. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. Over the last four years or so, I've faced a lot of change in my life, or a number of changes. As you've heard, we brought in some church consultants from overseas to look over this whole organization, its strengths, its weaknesses. And to move us forward, I and other staff, we had to embrace some very challenging and uncomfortable meetings and discussions. I'll never forget the time when we went through the weaknesses of the organization. They got this, you know, the, the, the screen out and began to list all the weaknesses. And of course, the weaknesses were really a reflection of me because I was in charge of the organization. I remember sitting there thinking, man, this is painful. I bristled and I thought, hmm, how do I dare say those things about this place? But friends, I had to allow God to, to, to do something in my life. I had to allow adjustments to take place, and I sat there thinking to myself, I don't like this, I hate it, but if this organization is going to move forward, I've got to take it on and embrace it. For your advantage and for my advantage. I could have resisted, and we would not have moved forward as a group into all that God has for us. But to move forward, you have to embrace what God does, because the result will benefit all of us. The key is knowing that the changes are from God. But when there's a shift in heaven, what's happening over church in London? There's a sift on the ground. There's a sift on earth. If you want God to shift heaven over your life, you want some fresh rain, fresh fruitfulness, you've got to go through a sifting, an adjustment period, some pruning, some changes. Throughout church history, one denomination after another has resisted the new move of the Holy Spirit. We all know that. What has God had to do? God said to raise up another denomination that would embrace what he wanted to do. In other words, God had to create a new wineskin to move the church of Jesus Christ forward because the old wineskin refused to change. Tragic, isn't it? So they get moved to the side and God brings in the new. Willingness to change as God moves is paramount. But not only have some people been unwilling to change, friends, but they have gone further, and they have persecuted those bringing change. That's the history of the church. It's bad enough, friends, to resist change, but then to persecute and fight against what God is trying to do is taking it to another place again. See, life's like driving a car. It's wise to check the rear view mirror now and then, right? But the rear view mirror is to glance at, not stare at. Staring at where you've been will only land you in the ditch. You can't move forward and keep looking back. You can't embrace the future and hold on to the past because what's it going to do? It's going to stretch you and rip you apart. Let the past go. It wasn't as good as you think it was. Come on, move forward, go into the new. God is up to something good in your life. It may not make any sense right now. It may look like a mess, but one day the jigsaw is all going to come together and that portrait that comes out of that jigsaw will be magnificent to behold and it will be your life and how God has arranged it all. John Maxwell says this, losers yearn for the past and get stuck in it. Winners learn from the past and let go of it. Which one are you? Stuck in the past? Yearning for the old days, which weren't anything like you think they were. 
And friends, if we're not addicted to change, if we don't embrace change easily, life is going to be miserable. God is all about change. So here's my question to you. How well do you handle change? How many of you are good at handling change? Yeah, about 10 people. It's about 0.001%. So most of you, the rest of you need to hear this message and hear it well, okay? There are early adopters. Yep, I'm on board, let's go. There are middle adopters. Give me a week. Yep, I'm with you. There are late adopters. Hey, give me three months, but I'll be on board. And then there are non-adopters. They say, no way, never. I'm not going to change with this new thing. Non-adopters. The Amish are an example of non-adopters. There's a pastor who was objecting to new trends in music. He said this, there are reasons for opposing it. It's too new. It's too worldly. New music is not as pleasant. There are so many new songs. You can't learn them all. Puts too much emphasis on the instruments and not enough on godly lyrics. I could have said this. It's a money-making scene. This was said in 1723. <laughs> 300 years ago by a pastor attacking Isaac Watts, who was seen as the father of hymns. Listen, embrace change. Tell the person next to you, come on, embrace change. Embrace change. All right, yeah. <laughs> Who's getting the message today? All right? All right. Let's go now to a verse you will not like, Jeremiah 48. We read these words. See, what happens is to change us, God changes our circumstances. Hello? You wanting change? Okay, so Jeremiah 48, 11 says, Moab has been at ease from his youth. He settled on his dregs. He's not been emptied from vessel to vessel. No change is taking place. Nor has he gone into captivity. Therefore, his taste remained in him. And his scent has not changed. Now, the picture here is what Moab is pictured as wine in the making. And part of the process is pouring the wine from one jar to another. So the sediment that settled on the bottom of the jar gets left behind and goes to a new why new, new jar where the sediment's no longer there. And that's how you create good wine. You've got to get rid of the, the settled sediment. So what happened to Moab? Moab had not been poured from vessel to vessel. It had settled on the dregs and become like wine that had an awful taste. It was contaminated. There was no progress being made. And so what does God do in order to change Moab? You know, some people, there, you, you meet them 10 years later, and they're exactly the same as they were 10 years before. Or some of them are worse. You listen to them, there's bitterness, there's anger, there's all these kind of things. There's, they're not growing, they're not progressing, they're not becoming better people. So in order to change Moab, she gets sent into captivity. God pours her from it into another vessel so that her taste becomes more delightful. And God pours you and I from vessel to vessel. He changes things in our lives so we don't become distasteful like Moab. We need change to continue to grow and become better people. We don't get stuck in the mud. What about Israel? They went to idolatry. Repeated warnings from the prophets to give it up, and they, they didn't. So God poured them into a new vessel, and they went into Babylonian captivity. A very idolatrous nation. And somewhere in the captivity, they were changed. And they got rid of their idolatry by overdose. To this day, Israel remains free of idolatry. How was Israel changed? By being poured into another vessel. Can I say this? For you, for me, for all of us, there's some idols in our lives that God wants to get rid of. Some of those idols, we don't even know they're there. But God knows they're there. So he pushes us into another vessel. He changes our circumstance because he wants to deal with some stuff in our lives that is causing our taste to be distasteful. Friends, God knows what he's trying to outwork in your life and in mine. And one of the greatest agents of transformation is change. But also God uses other people to change us. Come to Proverbs 27 and verse 17 for another verse that you will grossly dislike. 
As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Every person that is around you has been hand-picked by God for you. Hallelujah. Mm. Thank God for every person that you are surrounded by. God hand-picked your wife. Not an amen in the house. Think about that. Think about that, church. Not one amen. God hand-picked your husband. How come the... How come... Yeah, that's right. God hand-picked your boss. God handpicked your employees. Let's move on from there. That's not so good. So thank God for the people he sent into your life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. God sent them to you. Why? To get rid of some distasteful things in our lives. And everyone said? Amen. Move to the next point. How are we going to cope with change? I'm going to give you four points. Number one is this, an attitude of trust. When we choose to trust God, friends, this is huge. They say the middle verse of the Bible is about trusting God, he who trusts in the Lord. Middle verse. Christianity is all about trust. And friends, if you can grab that truth and and, and be a person that trusts God, it will change everything. I remember a time in my life, I was going through a really, really tough patch And I was struggling to come to terms with it. I was struggling to get on top of it. I went into the 24th seven prayer room, and the Lord said to me, Tuck, why don't you trust me? And I thought, well, that's a creative new idea. I'll try that. (laughs) So that's how I did it. I just began to say, God, I trust you. Nothing seemed to change. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. And I just said, I don't know for how long, but I kept on saying it. Do you know, over a period of time, not long after that, tremendous grace came into my heart. And God sorted everything out, and I walked in peace. What was the key? A choice. I choose to trust God. You have to get it from your head to your heart, and sometimes you do that through declaration. Shout it! I was in that room. I was yelling. I, I, it was pretty loud. It's probably when our neighbors complained. It was probably me. I yell. I, God, I choose to trust you. Friends, your ability to choose is powerful. You know, Adam and Eve could choose to sin or not to sin. They, they had a free will. Your ability to choose to trust God is enormous. Take advantage of it. It's going to help you. Here's a verse that I've really enjoyed. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. You might be in a situation today, you don't know what to do. Everything's a mess. Things are shambles. You don't know which way is up, which way is down. You don't know what, where to go or anything like that. Friends, I, I got into that situation when, we, when our city church uh, leadership changed. I sort of said, God, I don't know what to do. God, I haven't got a clue what to do. But my eyes are upon you. And friends, that took me through. And today God's just blessing our city church. It's wonderful. To give thanks in the midst of change, you will find grace and strength. To prepare Joseph for his calling, he was poured from vessel to vessel. Sometimes... Where he was poured looked like a demotion. He goes into prison. It's a demotion. It's like, God, what's going on? Don't you move me forward? Hey, you know how God works promotion? By demotion. He goes in the opposites. How do you gain? You got to lose. How do you receive? You got to give. How do you get promoted? You get demoted. It's just the ways of God. If you can follow that pattern right throughout Scripture. But the brilliant thing about Joseph is he had a faith that could see God in everything. It's almost like his own. You know, Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. Moses, Joseph, they had this, this, this heart, this walk with God where they could just see God. It may not have been clear, it may have been messy and mucky, but they could see that God was behind everything that was happening. So in Genesis 50 verse 20, Joseph says to his brothers, you intended to harden me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is being done, the saving of many lives. Trust is the key to moving forward in what God has for you. (coughs) Secondly, letting go. When circumstances change, there's a letting go, a loss 
to make room for something new. You know, it's hard to grab the future if you're holding on to the past. You've got to let it go. Let it sail away into the breeze, and you grab the great future that God has got ahead of you. Grief is a God-given process to help us to come to terms with losses. And we do face losses, and we need time to emotionally adjust. But at the end of the day, if you're going to move forward, you've got to let go. Everyone say it with me. Let go. Say it again. Let go. Yeah, let go. Let go. Yeah, yeah. If you can do that, friends, cut the cord, move forward into all that God has got for you. Number three is one step at a time. In other words, if you're going through change, don't look too far ahead. It can overwhelm you. It's a big mistake. I think the devil's strategy is always trying to get you to map out too far ahead, especially if you're in a difficult situation. Don't do that. There's a woman who lost her husband. Obviously a very challenging thing. And she said this. She said that she lived one day at a time. She said there was no five-year plan. There was no one-year plan. There was no one-month plan, not even a one-week plan. She just had a one-day plan. And she said living for one day at a time was what got her through. Matthew 6 and verse 34. A really important verse for you and for me. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. How many of you are worried about tomorrow? Don't raise your hands because virtually every hand's going to go up. Hey, God says, not talk about, God says, do not, a command, do not <laughs> worry about tomorrow. Then he tells you why not to. He says, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. In other words, what he's saying is, hey, there's enough trouble to get through today. Hello? Why would you add tomorrow's troubles onto today? Amen. And God only gives you grace for one day at a time. Amen. You don't have grace today for tomorrow. It's not given to you. You ain't got it. So if you try and add tomorrow to today, you're going to collapse. There's no grace for tomorrow. There's grace for today. His mercies are new each morning. Uh-huh. Get up in the morning, get mercy for that day, get through the day, and forget about the rest of it. I'm not talking against planning and all that sort of stuff. We understand that. Okay, here's a quote. Mile by mile, it's a trial. Yard by yard, it's so hard. Inch by inch, it's a cinch. You can all do one inch at a time. Come on, cut it back. Facing change, cut it back, cut it right back. I'm going to get through today with a smile in my heart, with a trust in God. All of you can trust God for today. All of you can trust God that today's going to be a reasonably good day. You're going to get through today. Hey, then you do the same tomorrow. Then you do the same the day after. Number four, do something. When major change hits us, we need to do what we can to help ourselves rather than just grumble and go into self-pity. Don't do that. Ruth lost her husband. She was poverty-stricken. So what'd she do? She took the only action she could. She went out and gleaned in a field, a demeaning work for poor people and strangers, but she did it. In doing so, the door opened to her future. She married the wealthy Boaz, and she found a special place in the purposes of God. Do something. Don't be too passive. Get there. And make it happen one day at a time. Let's go as our final passage to Isaiah 54 as we draw this out to a close. Isaiah 54. Familiar verses. It says in verse 2, enlarge the place of your tent. How many of you are keen to be enlarged? Yeah, not, not physically enlarged. I'm talking about <laughs> spiritually enlarged. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare length in your cords, strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and the left. Your descendants will inherit the nations, make the desolate cities inhabited. To make us more fruitful, God has to stretch us and expand our capacity. 
It's very dangerous if we try and stay the same. Hold on to the old form. Friends, with our consultants coming through, I could have held on to the old forms. Parts of me wanted to hold on. But then I would have missed the whole future, which I still can't see all that clearly, but I just know it's great and it's good and God knows what he's doing. If we hold on to our form, we become rigid. We may just break. You break. See, if you don't embrace change, you resist and you can, it can just smash you. We need to be like elastic, easily stretched in any direction. <laughs> Become elastic. Proverbs 21, verse 1. Very important verse. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. You are king's kids. You are kings and priests unto God. King's heart, your heart, mine, it needs to be in the hand of the Lord. And he turns it wherever he wishes. We need to be submitted to God's hand shaping our hearts into the future. I say it again. He knows what he's doing. If a tent is well watered, it can be stretched. Water can speak of God's word. If our lives are well watered, our tent can be stretched. If it's not well watered, it becomes hard and it can split and be very, very painful. We need to learn to thrive on change. It is God's ordained pathway to greater fruitfulness and greater blessing. Let's embrace the changes that God has for us Let's tackle one day at a time and move in to the wonderful future God has for us. The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. Change is here to stay. No matter how long you live, there are going to be seasons of real change, sometimes challenging change take place in your life. I really hope that this message has helped you to see the importance of handling change well so you can be the person you're meant to be and accomplish the things you desire in life. The next time change comes your way, why don't you say to yourself, I'm going to use this to my advantage. I'm going to maximize this change in my life. I would love to hear from you. Why don't you take a few moments, contact us via the website on the screen, send us your testimony or your prayer requests and let us know how you're getting on. Please join me again next week. Thanks for watching Running With Fire with Tark Barna from Church Unlimited. For more great free content, visit runningwithfire.com. You can send us your prayer requests, stream online TV and radio episodes and view blog articles. You can also connect with Tark Barna through Twitter for regular updates. Church Unlimited meets at two locations in Auckland, New Zealand. You're welcome to come along for a visit.